So I don't know if I quite deliver on the whole title, but I'll do what I can. <laughs> a biography of Julia Crawford could be written. It would require digging and stitching, since there is no extensive archival collection of her papers, nor have the vast majority of her works found their way into public institutions. But it could be done. You'd interview her surviving nephew. Uh, you would piece together the fragments from artist files, press clippings, catalogs, and other ephemera held at the National Gallery of Canada, the Art Gallery of Ontario, the Beaverbrook Gallery, and most significantly, the New Brunswick Museum. And there, in the latter institution, you'd find the largest, albeit not large, collection of archival materials and certainly the largest public collection of her paintings. A few of these even were published during her lifetime. Once you uh, gathered, yeah, this is the way she got Lily into the National Gallery of Canada by sending its reproduction on a Christmas card in 1956. They kept that. Um, once you gathered the patches, you would assemble the quilt, and the material would afford the choices of a few recognizable or established patterns. One choice would be to write a story of Crawford's success, her rise from humble origins as a New Brunswick rural school teacher to having her works exhibited nationally and internationally and singled out for praise by critics. Her ability to sustain her creative practice, continuing to develop and experiment as a modern painter over the course of 40 years without much in the line of patronage or institutional support. Another choice, which is a sort of mirror image of the success narrative, would attempt to rescue or recover Crawford's negligible reputation and correct the existing historiography that has afford afforded her virtually no place in the canon of Canadian art. What forms of discrimination led to this historical neglect? Well, she was the wrong gender. A woman modern artist with a constantly evolving style was not likely to be selected for star treatment in the Canadian pantheon of Crawford's generation. For another thing, she lived in New Brunswick, and for many years, as far as central Canadian art institutions were concerned, culture flowed like the St. Lawrence to the Maritimes, and decidedly not in the opposite direction. And to a certain extent, you could point to medium and subject matter as an obstacle. She was best known for her watercolors, and like Van Gogh, was known to paint flowers. Perhaps this choice of subject matter led one critic to discern in her work a feminine sensibility of a high order. As everyone at this conference knows, this kind of praise was praise only to a point. It imposed limits like an intransigent bouncer at Club Genius barring the door. I think, too, that uh, Crawford was just a little too old. She was a bit older than the generation of Peggy Nichol, Paraskeva Clark, and Marion Scott, who were female peers nationally. And she was older than Jack Humphrey, Miller Britton, and Ted Campbell, who were pe male peers locally. All of these factors could be combined in a biography that explains why you ought to know Julia Crawford and it, why it is an injustice that you have not known her heretofore. What I wish to stress today, and I think it is something that could be easily lost in a recovery biography, is the extent to which Crawford's present obscurity is a result of her own choices and refusals when playing the game of being a great artist. Perhaps also underlying these choices was naivete about the rules and the stakes of the game. I won't ignore this naivete, I don't want to dwell on it. There were certain rules that she thought she understood perfectly and others that she was aware of and deliberately ignored. In the former category, i.e. rules she believed in, I would place her commitment to the basic aesthetic tenets of modern art. Some of the examples of Crawford's watercolors in the collection of the New Brunswick Museum are highly stylized. And I'm going to return to that word some and the apparent inconsistency of her oeuvre. These paintings record Crawford's performance as a modernist auteur. I had the good fortune of having uh, the, artist, the curator, museum's curator, Peter Larocque, talk me through this record in the case of the large watercolor befogged. Rock emphasizes the confidence of the technique and the required speed of execution. This is quite a large um, watercolor, actually. 
and it allowed for large gestures. This was painting from the shoulder and not from the wrist. In the best of Crawford's work, Leroc discerns a tactile appreciation of materials and what he calls vitality. In that this word refers to the mode of representation and not the subject represented, Leroc sees Crawford in much the same light as did contemporary critics who singled out Crawford's work from group shows for particular praise. When reviewing the 1942 annual exhibit of the Maritime Art Association, Crawford's peer Jack Humphrey called the quarry undoubtedly among the most satisfying paintings in the collection. He thought it reflected the approach of Cezanne. He does not explain exactly why. Was it the light, the perspective, the handling? But he was clearly placing Crawford in what was for him and for most painters uh, of the era, exalted company. Crawford too was fond of Quarry, when in 1943 the patron of the New Brunswick Museum's art collection, Alice Webster, decided it was time to add a Crawford to the collection. Crawford was 47 years old at the time. This was her first sale to a public institution. Crawford urged her towards Quarry rather than Webster's choice, a painting called Barnesville. I would rather be represented by the Quarry because I really think it has something. Crawford had been asking $100 for Quarry, but for Webster, she'd give it for the bargain price of 75. Webster instead bought Barnesville for $70. When Crawford's work traveled further afield, praise from critics was not more elusive. Of still life showing in Toronto, Graham McInnes wrote about the strength and spirited bravura of this group of flowers. The same year, uh, Crawford exhibited in Paris in the Salon of the French Society of Artists. And La, Re La Revue Moderne reproduced one of her works along with praise of Crawford's love, in this quotation, love of color and its variations, a solid technique and decorative sense. The following year, Crawford exhibit, exhibited Lily in the same salon and saved this review. A watercolor entitled Lily attracted general attention because of its airy lightness and exquisite grace. Lily would continue to earn plaudits for Crawford. It was selected for the Canadian Trends exhibition accompanying the 1941 Kingston Conference of Canadian Artists, and it was chosen for reproduction in the published conference proceedings. And then in 1945, Crawford's Flowers was selected to travel to Brazil as part of an exhibition of contemporary Canadian painting. I should like to pay homage to Julia Crawford, wrote the Brazilian critic Geraldo Ferraz in his review of the show, whose flowers is a product of discreet observation of great delicacy in an exacting genre. Is it any wonder that Crawford told the reporter in 1949 that she believes it is best to exhibit where an artist is not personally known. Then only the painting is judged and there is no chance for thought or consideration to the person who composed it. Yes, Crawford dreamed of the pure hierarchy of form. She, surely she knew by this time that it was wishful thinking. Crawford was personally known to many of the players on the field of Canadian art in her era. She was one of the delegates to the Kingston Conference, and you can see her photograph here in the front row of a lecture given on old master techniques. A very young Alma Duncan uh, is right beside her, looking directly into the camera. It only emphasizes the impression that Crawford appears somewhat older than most of the women in attendance. Now, I cannot look at this photograph with an unbiased eye. I know that Crawford spent her early 20s, before the 1920s, as a teacher in rural New Brunswick. So I cannot say with absolute confidence that she appears in this photograph to be the most person most likely to have done so. I think, though, this is the case. Is it because her dress seems unlike the others? Clearly, stripes were out of mode, and the only other floral pattern than the one Crawford is wearing is quite different, with large sunflowers. And even more clearly, Crawford is the only person in the room both willing and able to take notes at this lecture. 
This, I realize, is not evidence of a high order. Rather than a proof, let us call my reading of this photograph a metaphor for Crawford's position within the field of Canadian art, a marginal insider. The field of cultural production, Pierre Bourdieu tells us, is the site of struggles in which what is at stake is the power to impose the dominant definition of the artist and therefore to delimit the population of those entitled to take part in the struggle to define the artist. Crawford's presence at Kingston indicates that she was recognized by the field as a legitimate artist. By the late 1930s, the regular acceptance of her work at national juried exhibitions suggests that she was already not really an outsider, nor even like Maude Lewis or the Bouchards, an artist whose lack of sophistication prompts adoption and consecration. By 1936, the National Gallery of Canada was sending Crawford an information form for the purpose of making a record of artists and their work. Not, of course, that the institution ever purchased any of said work in Crawford's case. Crawford's response to the information forms are as close as we have to her autobiography, her souvenirs, to use Professor Shepard's term. Perhaps they uh, explain the lukewarm embrace she was given by Canadian art institutions in spite of her critical triumphs abroad. They reveal that Crawford was worse than a primitive. She was a club woman. The most detailed of these forms is undated, but it appears to be from 1944. And in the longer paper, I quote from it at length to reveal its entire lack of guile. Um, so I'm not going to read all of these to you. She does point out her grade point average in uh, elementary school. 1918 to 1925, so she's taught rurally before this, then she moves to St. John in 1918, uh, teaches in St. John, first as an assistant, then grade three and grade seven, attended Miss Alice Haggerty's class in art, St. John, St. John Art Club, took public speaking and expression lessons from Amelia Green and Mrs. Clark, was in Miss Green's Greek statues at the Capitol Theater, and in a play directed by Mrs. Clark at St. Peter's, attended gym classes at the YWCA, and was in Scotch dance and display at Capitol, took dancing lessons, took some piano lessons from Professor Ford. It goes on and on. 1925 summer, had jaundice. I think I put that one up. Okay, 1931, summer sick, 1934, had a delightful seven weeks European travel, paid back debts and saved enough for it. 1939, Graham McInnes in book Canadian Art mentions name. And uh, at the end here, 1944, sick, January till June plus, nervous exhaustion, better. 1943, made sketches from my room of people in square and rested, rested, rested. Besides, and there are other forms, um, Besides being refreshingly honest and breezy, these forms show Crawford had little ability to discern between those events of her life that could provide her with distinction and advance her career, say, Revue Moderne, from those that could not, say, jaundice. Um, if she was, if when she was providing her GPA in grade eight, she was attempting to construct a narrative about her early prodigious talent, she was making a very poor job of it. Um, and I, I say more in the longer paper about the local context and her local involvements, but I'm going to talk about the national one here. When Crawford was elected to membership in the Canadian Society of Paint Painters and Watercolor in 1940, at least one Toronto-based member of the society was ambivalent. Kevin Atkins passed on the news to, in a letter to Carl Schaefer. Miss Crawford of New Brunswick also elected, good but questionable, her latest work not quite so strong. Atkins would not be the last to Crawford, uh, question Crawford's consistency. Forty years later, Christina Sabat concluded a review of Cro a Crawford retrospective in Fredericton by writing, it was obvious that the artist had absorbed and mastered many different styles and ideas, but it seemed that she never really allowed herself the freedom of self-discovery. Consider the evidence on which these judgments are based. Atkins would have seen the one or two paintings a year that Crawford could afford to sh ship to the CSPW annual e exhibitions. Sabat had a larger body of work to contemplate, but it was a relatively small show in a private gallery with works drawn from a span of 30 years of the artist's work. 
If we look at the collection of Crawfords in the New Brunswick Museum, it too is a very mixed assemblage. There are still lifes, landscapes, and portraits, but they range markedly from the conventional to the expressive. At one person shows organized during Crawford's lifetime, her inconstancy was noted, but not in the same way. Uh, for Know Your Own Artist exhibition in 1949, Avery Shaw writes, Hers is the art of a painter who is always seeking for new impressions and who retains the capacity for experimenting with her medium and her approach to art. This is not the easiest way to paint. Many artists tend to work out formulas based upon their previous successes, whereas constant experimenting can sometimes produce its failures. The justification of such of a, an approach is justified by the current uh, exhibition upon the walls of the museum. And then in 1954, she had a solo show at the University of Maine. Rarely has the University of Maine Art Gallery so an exhibition of watercolors with such variety of technique, said the head of the university's art department, Vincent Hartkin. Using a wide range in her palace, the artist achieves in a very unique manner a style and brushstroke closely related to the subject she's depicting. This accomplishment is not often attained in the watercolor medium. Over time, the coherence of Crawford's constant experimenting has been lost. Um, Crawford was painting non-objective works by 1946 at the latest, i.e. two years before Refus Global, and she continued to work, produ produce works of this kind for the remainder of her life. They are always mentioned, though never described, in the local press coverage of the many exhibitions Crawford staged in her own studio. These are actually Crawford's students' work. They aren't, aren't her work. This was a, a short course she was running in Sault Ste. Marie, where she was invited to teach in one summer. Um, these are so the most extensive discussion comes in a 1959 article. In her abstract compositions, Crawford begins with an idea and enlarges on it. Explaining this form of art, she makes it sound exceedingly simple. Miss Crawford claims abstract painting, with its apartness from concrete relation or embodiment, is a protest against the materialism which is so prevalent in our day. Clearly, this was an important part of her creative practice for an extended period in her career. I have never seen one, and neither has P Peter LaRock at the New Brunswick Museum. Perhaps one of you has? Anyone? No? Zero, eh? This is not the only kind of work by Crawford that's no longer easy to find. An anonymous reviewer of a 1979 selection of works by Crawford suggests that she had a wonderful sense of humor as displayed in her 1940 Impressions of the Festival. What kind of comedy did this work convey? Was it a satire akin to Miller Britton's Little Theater Rehearsal? I've never seen any work of this kind either. The point here is that much of Crawford's work is not available in original or even in reproduction to the researcher. On the one hand, this can be attributed to neglect and discrimination. Certainly there's a case to be made here. But on the other hand, it's also the result of Crawford's own choices and ideas. From surviving evidence, it seems that Crawford never made use of the services of an art dealer. People should buy paintings and not have them sold to them, she once wrote. She staged numerous exhibitions in her own studio on Canterbury Street in St. John, and for some of these she produced quite elaborate catalogs that list her solo shows. These included the New Brunswick Museum, University of New Brunswick, Acadia University, University of Maine, Netherwood Secondary School. Know that these are all local and with the possible exception of uh, two held in small towns, not staged in commercial private galleries. This catalog concludes by saying that her work was in many private collections. The local art market, which was both small and not particularly adventurous in taste, was Crawford's principal market and it was the one and it was one that she approached on her own terms this is from an article 1959 when Crawford won second prize in Fredericton uh, Beaverbrook's gallery competition for artists in the Atlantic provinces in the photograph you can see Crawford is standing, paintbrush in hand, in front of the prize-winning depiction of Deer Island, the kind of painting that was in many ways her bread and butter. 
Crawford told the reporter Willard Richardson that she would not have sent the painting had she known in advance it was a competitive show. I do not favor competitions among paintings, she said. When she learned the nature of the exhibition, she consoled herself with her self-assessment that mine is not a prize-winning picture. Alan Jarvis, the judge of the event and former director of the NGC, obviously saw it differently. As a matter of principle, however, Crawford was uncomfortable with the process of creating an artistic hierarchy, even when she benefited from it. And then we have in the archives a report she wrote for the Maritime Art Association in 1942 uh, about Kathleen Shackleton's talk, Art the Machine and Reconstruction. Shackleton was an unabashedly commercial fine artist and Crawford editorializes on her talk. According to Crawford, Shackleton suggested that artists in Canada should make use of sales specialists in seeking a market for what they created. Would not, Crawford wondered, mediocre works be bestsellers under these conditions? If the artist became his own salesman, might he not become a better salesman than an artist? At the end of Crawford's report, it's difficult to discern whether she is summarizing Shackleton without comment or continuing to editorialize. It all simmers down to this. We want to have trust in our fellow men, no politics in art, no cheap competition, no outwitting, but tolerance and real help to one's fellow artists. Two minutes, okay. So I am going to, I've got a section here of uh, local politicking when it came to art teaching and essentially how a, a, an artist named Ted Crawford, it appears elbowed Julia Crawford out of her uh, job at the, um, at the vocational school where she'd taught uh, for 16 years. Uh, before this happened, she writes in a letter she was concerned that Campbell was monopolizing the teaching jobs. Ted Campbell now teaches at the Vocational Night School, Netherwood, Rothsey, Collegiate School, Normal School, and UMB. Somehow I feel this is wrong. We should see to it that the work and the pay, capital letters P-A-Y, should be more evenly distributed. Why was Jack Humphrey not given a chance or someone else? What should be done about that? And of course, I mean, given this letter, there's no little irony that Campbell replaces Crawford as full-time art teacher at the vocational school in the year that she was sick, January till June plus, nervous exhaustion. Whether this was, I mean, which, the chicken or the egg, I don't know. It's important to recall that the next line in Crawford's life history is better. She went on to get a new job at Netherwood School for Girls and taught pri also taught privately for the rest of her life. She had a long and successful career as a teacher, and she continued to paint, exhibit, and sell until she died in 1968. She made many choices typical of a number of Canadian women artists. She never married, had no children, and needed to devote a great deal of her time to finding a way to make a living. This material need, though, did not alter her aesthetic nor her ambivalence about the need to market her work. She was not particularly adept at building her career in a way that would be noticed in the centers of modern art, nor did she, like Hortense Gordon, have important allies in the field who could help her to do so. I sense that she reported with pride, not indignation, on the information sheets that Graham McInnes had mentioned her name in A Short History of Canadian Art in 1939. And I imagine that she would be delighted that Maria Tippett mentions her name not once but thrice in By a Lady. It would be a mistake to attempt to recover Julia Crawford as a canonical artist in an expanded canon. What would be more significant would be to trace her trajectory through the field as it occurred, to understand both the forces and the choices that led to her pre present obscurity. Many modernist critics claim to venerate originality, but what they really meant most of the time was variation. After all, if a work deployed codes that were entirely new, it would be unreadable. Biographers might try and think about their work in a similar way. We are trained to see recognizable patterns that ultimately are presupposed by the fact that we consider the subject worthy of biography. To put this another way, the choice of a subject of a biography, let us say a woman artist, already leads us to the kind of evidence, say reviews of exhibitions, public collections, that created the subject's already acknowledged position in the field. 
to see the field as an always contingent, always constructed web of social forces, and then to appropriately locate an individual's life and trajectory is, of course, an enormous, if not impossible, challenge. What strikes me as important to acknowledge in Crawford's case is the combination of her acceptance of some of the rules of being a modern artist, essentially the aesthetic ones, and her resistance to other less explicitly stated rules, those involving competition, hierarchy, self-aggrandizement, and the pursuit of larger than local markets. A biographer could conceivably tell this story but ambivalent tales about marginal figures are about as easy to sell as non-objective paintings in St. John, New Brunswick in 1946. In other words, it won't be easy, but I, I look forward if any of you are willing to take up the challenge. Thank you.